So the psychrometric chart is it's not only good to plot states, right? It's not only about finding oh, what is the state of a particular mixture. Remember the psychrometric chart, it's a, well, it's a thermodynamic state diagram. So it's a thermodynamic, it's a thermodynamic diagram. So we can plot states, we can plot paths as well. Let's, uh, let me bring up our, our, now our good friend, the uh, psychrometric chart here. I'm going to go into test up two. So remember, this is a, we're going to take a, a just a two second uh, detour through the memory lane to our good friend, the state postulate, right? Remember we said a, if you have a simple fluid, so a simple fluid, uh, that's a pure substance. So pure substance. The thermodynamic or the, the uh, postulate, uh, the state postulate says that you have, let's see, do you need two independent intensive properties to define the state? So simple fluid, pure substance, two independent state properties or properties. Those give you the state. Okay. Well, now if you've got a mixture, then you need one extra per property per extra component, right? So if you have just air as a, as a, as a pure substance, right? If there's no change in composition between the oxygen and the nitrogen, they don't react or anything, then you need just two independent properties to know what the state is. So temperature and pressure, that would do the trick. So for example, temperature and pressure, thing, all good. Now, if you have a mixture of uh, yeah, a mixture of pure substances, then the mixture itself is no longer a pure substance. So then we need plus one property, we need one more property per additional component. Per additional component. Okay. Well, in this case, in psychrometry, we have mixtures of air and water vapor. So we need an extra component because we need to know what's the, what's the ratio between the two. But right? I need to know how much air I have with respect to water. So this is why I need temperature, pressure, plus I need one piece of information about the composition. Well, that is omega, is one of them, right? Omega would do, this is a humidity ratio. Well, the psychrometric chart, it's a, it's a state diagram, it's a thermodynamic diagram where I'm assuming that the pressure is one atmosphere. So if I have T, P, omega, ding, this is all good. Now I'm going to assume P is about one atmosphere always, then I need two more independent intensive properties. So you need, for example, then you're left with T and omega. And that gives you what the state is. This is why if I find T, and I'm always assuming T is the thermodynamic temperature of the substance I'm or of the mixture as I'm looking at it. So that's when I say just T, I mean the dry bulb temperature. So if I know, for example, a dry bulb temperature of 20 and a mixture ratio or a humidity ratio of six, then I would go to the left and, and here I'm going to draw a straight line because now I know how to draw straight lines. Six, so straight line goes like this and then 20, zoop, there we go then I know that my state is right here at the intersection of these two lines. But those are not the only two properties that I could have. So for example, the, well, the, the humidity ratio is a property, the, well, now the relative humidity, I can compute it if I know what the state is. So it is itself a state property. So T omega is good, is a good pair of properties. Uh, T and phi is a good pair of properties. Uh, let's see if I know actually any two, Right, so if I know H and phi, H and omega, I could do any, any, uh, any mixture that I want, any mixture or any combination of properties. I could do H and phi, I could do phi and omega. 
this would be really annoying to solve in real life. But if I if I wanted to do so, something has a uh, let's see if I have a mixture ratio or a humidity ratio of six up here. So I'm going to draw my horizontal line there. I'm going to start from six. And I'm going to go through let's say six is roughly like this. And it has a relative humidity of 65%. Then I'm going to find my 60, 90, 80, 70, 60, 65 is out here. Then it's boom, right there. So this would be the point corresponding to a 65% relative humidity and six grams per kilogram of dry air humidity ratio. And I know I must be at a dry bulb temperature or at a temperature of 10, 11, 12 degrees Celsius. This is a thermodynamic diagram. So that means I don't only, I'm not only drawing states, I can also draw paths. I can go from state one to state two. And this is really useful uh, if you're dealing with HVAC because it turns out, as we all know, humans don't, we don't have fun. We don't feel well in any conditions. Actually, we, we here, I'm going to take this particular psychrometric chart away. And I'm going to bring one here. I'm shamelessly taking this one from, I'm going to keep the psychrometric chart because I really like it, but I want one that has the comfort zone drawn onto it. And this is, so here you have one, this is from the University of, uh, this is from the University of Ohio. And so it's a psychrometric chart. You have the red lines are well bu wet bulb temperature. The black lines are constant enthalpy temperatures. Um, horizontal dashed lines, those are humidity ratio. And you have the green lines, those are constant specific volume. So we have all the same information that we had before, but then superimposed, we have in green, here is an accepted, and I say an accepted comfort zone. So between 40 and 60% relative humidity and between 22 and 27. There's a personal preference to it, right? Some people will need a tighter comfort zone. Some people will feel better outside. So there's different standards depending to how organizations test how one feels. So I actually found in preparing for this particular video, I actually found, here's a really interesting, uh, this is a, a, this is from my website, HVAC, uh, dash eng.com. It has a really interesting, um, uh, this is a, a interactive psychrometric chart. So I can actually go and punch into it a point and here I'll see this is a dry bulb of 32.3. So it actually generates data points. Right, I want. So here's a dry bulb of 25.3 relative humidity, 54.78 absolute humidity or the humidity ratio is 11.2 grams per kilogram the vapor pressure. So it actually, I mean, with precision, it generates these points. Uh, I imagine I might be able to put paths into this, but what I wanted to see is there, there's a comfort overlay. So here we have the Giovanni bioclimactic chart. I think this is the one. Yes, that's right. So this is roughly, here's our green comfort zone, according to, uh, and actually this one goes from 20, or it sets the comfort zone from 20 to 27. But then you'll see that at 27, past 60 or past 50% humidity, uh, here it says you start to be a bit uncomfortable. So if it gets more humid, you do have to take it down a notch, up to a maximum humidity of about 80%. But that's really only at 25 degrees Celsius that you can tolerate that much. If 20, you want to be between 20 and 80%. I mean, before we had 40 and 60, it depends on how people uh, well, it depends on how you estimate this comfort zone. So for example, here, let's go look at, uh, ASHRAE. This is a standard. So here's the comfort zone. So ASHRAE is the American society of something, 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 um, and the E stands for engineering. Um, and so here's the comfort zone and that one goes from zero to a hundred. So basically this says that you can only live in a range of well, they're not wet bulb temperatures because the constant wet bulb temperatures are like this. So it's a weird range, but this is what it defines as, um, as the um, comfort zone. And it actually, in this case, it actually depends on 
interestingly enough, in this in this standard, you can probably say, oh, so metabolic rate seated with sedentary, sedentary activity. Here, let's put it standing with medium activity where you can live and actually you want slightly colder temperatures. Interesting. Whereas if you're resting or snoozing, there you go. Here's your comfort zone. Wow. Interesting. So this is if you're snoozing in a business suit. There he goes. We could play with this to no end. I'm going to put this back. So here, if you're shorts only, no shoes, better be above 35. Actually, I disagree with this. I walk around the house in shorts all the time. And if you have a fur coat on, ah, here's your comfort zone. Okay. So enough playing. Actually, if you want to go and look at this particular tool, you know, you can see the outdoor work heat index. Here's the, if you're in, in this case, if you're in completely shaded area, you know, ab above in the slight yellow region, this is, you have to be careful. Here's, you have to do extreme caution. And out in this range of temperature and humidity levels here, it is extremely dangerous to be even in full shade. So you can see if you're in, in some shading, direct summer sunlight, well, even 25 degrees Celsius and 30% relative humidity, you had better start being careful. Okay. So we can plot, so I'm going to go back to our bioclimactic chart there. And this one actually depends on the outdoor temperature and so on. But so if I'm in here, now this is my comfort zone. I want to draw paths on the, so one good question that we often answer with the psychrometric chart is how do I get back to this zone? If my current room, if my current space that I'm interested in, the car, the room, the office, the bathroom, the bedroom, whatever it is that I'm actually conditioning, that I am either heating or cooling or humidifying, dehumidifying, if I find myself outside of this comfort zone, how do I, how do I get back into it with thermodynamic processes that are available to, available to us engineers that we can actually make happen in real life. Okay. So how do we do this? Well, we can, um, I think I've, yes. So I'm going to come and bring back because I don't want to have this overlay on there for, for this particular uh, suite of discussion. So now I want to look at what are actual paths, or I'm just trying to get my notes here. So I cover all the paths that I want to talk about. So what are some actual paths that I could um, want to create or that I would, I would want to know actually what I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm trying to do a, a, a correlation between actual devices and paths on the psychrometric chart. How do they actually look? Okay. So we're going to start with easy one. The easy, well, what I think is the easiest one, heating and cooling, pure heating and cooling. I've got a duct. I've got air. Doesn't matter if it's a duct or a room, same thing. So I've got a duct and I have air flowing in at T1. And then I'm going to have a coil. Let's say it's a heating coil. So this is resistive. I'm going to put a voltage. I'm going to heat this up so that I'm giving just pure heat, Q dot. And so it's going to come out M dot air at T2. Well, just from conservation of mass, I know there's some amount of air coming in, same amount of air coming out. There's only one inlet, one outlet. I'm giving it heat, but I'm not actually adding any moisture or taking any away. So the amount of water coming in is equal to the amount of water coming out. So the ratio of moisture to uh, moisture to air is always the same. So that means this is a constant omega process. So this is omega one is equal to omega two. Okay. Well, if I started at, let's say outside of my comfort zone. So I've got air that said, I want to shoot air into this room. This is actually going to end up. So this air, this is coming from the outside. And then this is going into an office building. And here I have the, here's my, so the air is getting shot into a room. So this is coming from outside. So let's say it's 10 degrees outside and 
60% uh, relative humidity. So here I'm going to, I'm going to find 10 degrees and then I want 60% humidity. This is 50. This is 60. That means this is the air coming from outside, but I want to shoot. This is not going to be very comfortable. If I, if I shoot that air straight into an office, people are going to start freezing. So I want to heat it up. Can I hit my target? Can I hit my comfort zone? So if I heat at a constant, this is pure heating, <clears throat> excuse me. It's going to be a constant omega process. So it's a horizontal line because it's always the same value of omega. So I can find if I want to end up at, well, I can get to 20 degrees Celsius and 30 some percent humidity. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> Excuse me. So to go from 10 to 20 degrees Celsius. Now I could ask the question, how much heat did I have to supply in order to get from A to B? From 10 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius. I can draw, a, a, I'll draw a boundary around my system. And then I'm going to do my first law analysis. EEDT is equal to Q dot in minus work out plus M dot air H1 minus H2 like this. It's steady. There's no work. And so I find that Q dot in over M dot air is equal to H2 minus H1. Well, what is H2? I'm going to draw a straight line. Like so, and then what is H1? I find my value of H1. Like this. So it's about 20. So let's see. H2 is about 30, 31, 32.5. 32.5 minus 22. This is equal to 10.5 kilojoules per kilogram air, dry air. There we go. So that's my heating demand. So now. If I know how many offices I have to uh, supply air to, uh, then I can size, uh, depending on the range of temperatures I'll get from the outside, then I can size the size of heaters that I need to have in my system. There we go. Heating. If it was cooling, well, cooling is the same thing, except now instead of having heat going out, it's very, very similar. I'm going to have Q dot in. I'm going to pass coolant water going through. I'm going to put a thermoelectric cooler in there. So I have a cold surface there so I can absorb, uh, I can absorb heat. Whichever way I, I would like to, to do it, but I can, I just have a device that is able to extract heat from the airflow. Okay. Uh, let's see. So if I cool, so if I heat, we're going to the right. If I cool, I'm going to the left. So if I was going to cool from this point to that point, then this is a path going in this direction. Heating. Very easy. So pure heating and cooling will just go right or left. Um, I clear all the drawings. So what are some of the other ones? Then there is heating with humidification, cooling plus dehumidification, evaporative cooling, and mixing. Let's do evaporative, uh, not evaporative cooling, sorry. Let me, let's do cooling plus dehumidification. So this one is actually same device. I've got air coming in. Then I have a, I have a coil of basically something cold that can extract, that can extract heat from the flow. So Q dot goes out of the flow into my coolant. But now I extract so much, it happens the same thing that happens in your air conditioning is that water starts to drip. So somewhere here, I'm going to have to have some kind of pan so that water comes in here and then it drips out. So why does that happen? Well, let us start with, let us start somewhere. We're going to start somewhere. Oh, 
so we're going to start somewhere. Let's say we're getting air from the outside. It's a summer. So the air is coming in at 35 degrees Celsius and 80% humidity. Sorry, I just need to follow the line. 35 and oh boy. Okay, I shot too high. Let's do 30 and 35 and 60% just because I'm going off the chart. So let's see 40, 50, 60. So 35, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. We just have to go up. It's this line over here. And I said 60. Okay, so we're about here. All right, so that's the air entering uh, entering my system. That's the air coming in here at state. We're going to label that state one. This is state one. Now I start cooling. Okay, I start cooling. Top, 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 top. I march along this line. And then boom, oh, I get to this bizarre line. I can't go further left. Otherwise, I'm going to fall off the chart. So I'm fully humid. Well, what happens is water starts to condense. And now we start to follow what, what is the saturation line. So then we start to follow this line down and down and down until we reach. Uh, well, now that's a good question. Let's say we're going to take this all the way down to like 10 degrees Celsius. Now here, there you go. That would be, that would be cooling and then dehumidification. This is how a dehumidifier basically works. And then if you don't want to shoot back cold air straight into the room, then you would want to heat it back up. So I would want to go I'm going to draw a straight line. So then I would want to add a straight heating section all the way out to, let's say I want to shoot it back at the same, I started at 35 degrees Celsius, so at the same 35 degrees Celsius. So now this process would be one to two to three. So one, two, three is cooling with dehumidification. And then three to four is just heating. So this combination of processes would be what happens in a dehumidifier. So I took air from 60% relative humidity and I brought it all the way down to 22.5% relative humidity. Cool. Okay. Um, that's good. So now let's do heating with humidification. So now I want to add, I want to add uh, well, actually, before we before we do this, um, let's do evaporative cooling. Uh, here, let me clear it. So now we've done. So let's see, we've done heating, heating and cooling. This is just a horizontal line. We've done cooling with dehumidification. It's the, and then follow the line. Uh, now I want to do evaporative cooling. So evaporative cooling, I have, let's say a, a tube like this. And then actually, the, so one device that we use a lot, and if you live in Montreal, you probably, you may have never seen those. Um, they're called uh, swap coolers. They're much more uh, popular in, in places that have hot and dry weather. So the way these works is we have air and usually we'll, we'll put in a fan to accelerate the process. And then I'll have a little source of water over here. And then I'll put a wick. This can be like a pad of hay or it can be a, a can be a little uh, 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 sort of like a ceramic substrate. Basically, it's anything that can draw water by capillary action. Uh, another way, another way would be to spritz. It would be to, to actually like like mist water with little jets 
Uh, but this decapillary reaction is pretty nice because it takes no power. So the air goes through, and then as it goes through, the water that's gone up through capillary action and that, that little water film, some of the water molecules evaporate, and then you have air at a higher, uh, at a higher relative humidity. So if I draw, the fan doesn't really matter to the process of evaporative cooling. That's just using forced convection instead of natural convection to make it faster. So if I draw a system around my evaporative cooler, you'll notice there's no work and there's no Q. So if this is a steady process, uh, plus M dot H1 minus H2. So if this is a steady process, no heat transfer, no work, well, M dot is constant. So H1 has to be equal to H2. So evaporative cooling is a constant H. Uh, it's a constant enthalpy process. So if you start in, and this is why it's uh, it works well in a place that is hot and hot and dry. So let's say the outside air is at 35 degrees Celsius and 4% humidity. Oh. So you may laugh at 4% humidity, but it does happen. I once lived in a place called Los Alamos. And then one day I looked at the weather report and it said the relative humidity was three. Not three less than yesterday's percentage. It was 3%. Okay, so we go into a constant H, boom, like this. So with evaporative cooling, I can reach any state, and they're at constant H, so there's no power demand, and I can reach any state that is on this blue line. So if I want to shoot the air at 20 degrees Celsius back into the room, then I would be coming out here. So this would be one to two. This is evaporative cooling. So now instead of there's no power demand, so this is not what I would want to size, but now I can calculate, I'm just gonna draw two horizontal lines. So I know I started at this amount of water, just under two, something like 1 1.5, 1.7 1 grams per kilogram of dry air. And I ended up at just here at about you know, 10, uh, sorry, 7.75. Uh, so now I know that the rate at which, uh, the rate at which we need to supply liquid water is going to be omega two minus omega one times M dot A. So now I can I can size the speed at which uh, we're going to be uh, consuming water in order to cool the space. <clears throat> you can also see why it works much better in uh, dry climates. If we started at, well, you can see that, remember our, our comfort zone was something like, I don't know, let's be a little bit, um, they're all dried in green, I've got colors. It was something like 20% relative humidity to somewhere around 60. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is our this is our comfort zone. And then you see from the point where we started with the swamp cooler, I can find an endpoint within the green square. But if I live in a hot and or if I'm in summer in Montreal where it's hot and not dry, it's hot and humid. So we're gonna go up 35 degrees Celsius. And let's say even, we don't even have to go that high. 35 and there, 40% humidity, which is wholly attainable in, in summers here. We go back to blue. And my constant H process, I can only find, I can only reach states that are along this blue line up here. So I can only end up here. And none of these states are comfortable. So I don't want to get any of that air shot at me during summer. This is not fun. This does not help me at all. 
So now you can see why the swamp cooler really works in dry climates, but not in very humid, not in even moderately humid climates. Okay, um, let me erase some things. I don't want to erase my list. So we've done, I'm just gonna get my states back. So what do we have left? Now we have done uh, heating and cooling, heating, evaporative cooling, so we have heating plus humidification as well as mixing. Okay, so heating plus humidification, it's actually kind of straightforward now that we've done uh, evaporative cooling, which we've said is a constant H line like this. So heating with humi oh, heating plus humidification. And we have to do this because when you heat up a flow, so here's my air is coming in at state one. I'm gonna give it heat. This is your standard house in the winter in Quebec. I give it heat, I end up at a state two, which is gonna be very dry. So let's say I'm taking outside air uh, where it's oh, uh, zero and whatever, whatever anything, 40% humidity doesn't actually matter there we go and then i'm going to heat it up so heating is a constant it's a horizontal process it's a constant omega process i can only reach i can only reach state on this blue line and here again let me draw an approximate i'm going to draw an approximate so 20 i'm going to draw an Proximate comfort zone. It was roughly like this. There's something like this. Right? There you go. So I want to reach a state inside this green box. Well, if I just heat up cold air, I can't read it, reach it. It stays incredibly dry. This is why we need a humidifier in Montreal, in Quebec. Because if you just heat up outside air, your house gets really, really, really dry. And then you get nosebleeds. So what I do is I add a humidifier. Oh, okay. Well, I'll keep it in green. Or I come here. And then I'm just going to mist water in here. Okay. So now if I mist, uh, if I mist water to evaporate it, well, now, so let's say maybe my state two is over here. Oh, now I'm going to go back to blue. Though. So let's say my state two is over here, one to two, this depending on the amount of heat that I give it. Then if I mist in warm water, I'm going to be giving H. So then I'm going to end up on a straight line. I'll end up up here. And if I spritz cold water or room temperature, or whatever, colder, colder water than this 24, then I'm going to be cooling this water as well a little bit, and I'm going to end up here. So this is if T3 is greater than T2. So if I'm using hot water, T3 less than T2. There we go. This is heating with humidification. Um, there we go. And now the last one is mixing. And mixing is really interesting because it's, it's very easy to write the equations. It's really annoying to solve them with math. And on the plot, it's really, really easy. Okay. I have some kind of ducts. And this is a standard problem in big, uh, large buildings with uh, large buildings with uh, automated air control. I'll have air coming in from the outside. This is M, M dot air one comes in at omega one, T one. And I have recycled air from within the building, M dot air two, omega two, T two. There we go. And now it's going to come out at M dot air three, omega three, T three. 
this is a standard problem. Uh, you have to supply a certain amount of fresh air to a building in order to, for CO2 not to build up, but you don't want to just cool down your building all the time. So you, uh, well, you want to heat it up and then one, one, you also want to recirculate the air in the building. So actually what you do is that within your recirculation loop, I'm just going to have a damper and I'm going to open and close to supply more or less air from the outside. <laughs> It's a standard, yeah, it's a standard construction. So, uh, conservation of mass, conservation of energy. Okay, so conservation of mass, I have two, again, because I've got air and water. So conservation of mass for the air says that m dot air one plus m dot air two is equal to m dot air three. Conservation of mass for the water says that omega one times m dot air one, right? This is a, equal to the amount of water vapor coming in through stream one plus omega two m dot air two is equal to omega three m dot air three. And then we have, well, this is a steady process this is steady, uh, no heat transfer. Oh, I didn't draw my system. Here's my system. These are often insulated, so there's no, so Q dot's equal to zero, there's no work. The work is equal to zero, so that means that it's a, what's a constant enthalpy process? So I'm going to have M dot air one H one plus m dot air to h2 is equal to m dot air 3 h3. There we go. And now I'm just going to bring up I'm just going to bring up the actual solution. So if you if you use these three equations, you can eliminate so you can eliminate m dot air three. And then you get to this equation, you get to m dot air one over m dot air two is equal to omega two minus omega three over omega three minus omega one, which is also equal to H two minus H three over H3 minus H1. Wow, not very intuitive. Well, let's do an example. I want to mix, I'm going to pick two states at random. One is here and one is there. Okay, I want to mix these two states. These are linear equations. I'm going to draw a straight line. When I mix, so this is my air at state one, mixing with my air at state two, my resulting air at state three is gonna be somewhere on this straight line in between these two states. Where it's going to be is, I'm gonna draw a couple more, a few more lines. So here's my projection on the constant enthalpy lines. like this, and here's my projections on the constant omega lines, one, two, there we go. So we're going to come out somewhere on this line, let's say over here. Uh, oh, we'll draw just a couple more. Here's the projections of my mixed state, state three, like so. And then we will find that the ratio of omega two minus omega three, that is this length over here, divided by omega three minus omega one, divided by that length over this, is equal to H two minus H three, this length, over 
that length, which is they're all equal to m dot a one, m dot air at one over m dot air at two. That's it. So if I want to, so here, let me just erase. So let me erase a couple of these. Let me just erase this mixed state. So if I mix air at state one with air at state two, and I want the air to come out in the middle at 30 degrees Celsius, then I'm just going to take, okay, I want to know, so I want the air to come out at 30 degrees Celsius. How do, what is the ratio of state one air to state two air? I'm just going to draw my vertical line, 30 degrees Celsius. That is my target. That means that my mixed state is right there. And that's it. Then I can just draw a horizontal line like so. And then I'll take a ruler and I'll measure this height. This height divided by that height will be the ratio of the two mass flow rates. And that's it. We have our solution. Then I know how much I need to open that damper in order to allow enough air to come in. That's it. Um, these are all of the basic states or all of the basic paths, I should say, that we are going to examine uh, on the psychrometric chart.